Well, thank you very much, Professor Hitchcock, to be here today. Um, this is the first part of the series called French American Histories, One Stories, Two Narratives, which will explore a lot of different aspects of the French American relations um, in this history, but also in our own present. And as you can hear, one story, two narratives, is that, of course, the com there's quite a complex relation between France and America. So today we're going to discuss the relationship between President Eisenhower and President Charles de Gaulle in the context of an exhibition that is held here called Eisenhower de Gaulle, L'Alliance, or Alliance and Friendship in War and Peace, which is now held here at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C. And of course, today we're going to talk about this relationship in order to reflect on this very important moment of French and American cooperation, and hopefully also to learn some lessons for the bonds between France and America today, the United States today. So William Hitchcock is the James Madison Professor of History at the University of Virginia. His work and teaching focus on the global history of the 20th century, and in particular, the era of the two world wars and the Cold War, which of course is particularly the topic of today and especially relations between Eisenhower and de Gaulle. So he received his PhD from Yale University and wrote a book soon after called France Restored, Cold War Dip Diplomacy and the Quest for Leadership in Europe, in which of course de Gaulle plays an important role. He also co-edited and worked on several other books and amongst which, um, the most recent one, The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s, which is published in 2018. So he's, of course, the foremost expert on both <laughs> Eisenhower and um, also that whole French history. So thank you so much for being here to talk about this. It's a pleasure. My pleasure. About the crucial relationship. Um, and so the work of uh, your recent book, The Age of Eisenhower, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because, okay. of course, uh, that will be a good kickoff of this discussion. So it's drawing on newly declassified documents and also thousands of pages of unpublished material, or at least working upon, of course, also other historians. But there is a lot of new material, and you really propose a new interpretation of the man itself and, of course, his accomplishments. So, of course, the whole um, period of this 1950s, which is particularly Eisenhower's period, is marked by McCarthyism, the Korean War, civil rights movements, and also the Cold War conflict of course, quite the complicated and um, challenging time for him <laughs> at the time. And so um, one of Eisenhower's duties, but also challenges, was, of course, to strengthen the transatlantic ties, particularly after the Second World War and its reconstruction leading up into the Cold War. And so his relationship with de Gaulle is quite essential in that. Mm, so that's mm. where we want to focus on today. Absolutely. All right. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the image of President Eisenhower from his presidency up until today that, of course, has changed quite a bit? Sure. So it's important to, to wind our minds back and remember that time period from about the middle of the Second World War, sort of about 1943, to the beginning of the Kennedy period, the jo when John Kennedy became president in 1961. That period of about 15 years is a period in which the Second World War comes to an end, the beginnings of the Cold War happen, NATO is formed, um, Europe is divided, um, uh, the Korean War begins, a, a whole series of international crises occur. Dwight Eisenhower presided over all of that, and he was the best known, most popular, most admired man in America throughout that entire period. So today, Eisenhower is I wouldn't say he's forgotten, he's remembered, but he's, the complexity, his achievements are not as well known as we might think. It's crucial to understand how much he accomplished in that 15 year period, not only as president, because of course he was president of the United States from 1953 through 1961. He, was, he, he succeeded uh, Harry Truman and, and his successor was John Kennedy. I think the reason that he, his, his, his reputation went down, when he, for his presidential reputation, is that he had the misfortune to be president just after Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal and the accomplishments of that period, and then Harry Truman, who you know, reinforced them, and John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, especially John Kennedy, who was half, of his, half his age, handsome, dynamic, charming. He became a world popular figure. No one can forget Kennedy. Eisenhower looked a little sad if, by comparison. <laughs> And so what happened was the thesis took hold that America, for 20 years of Roosevelt and Truman, 
and then for eight years of Kennedy and Johnson, had been blessed with this period of extraordinary democratic activism and progress and the making of the social, social safety net and the welfare state. And in between Eisenhower, what did he do? He played golf. Uh, he traveled a little bit here and there. Um, everyone was happy in the 50s. Nothing much happened. Uh, so he got lucky. So he was a nice guy, but everyone was basically taking a very long nap while Eisenhower was president. If you go further into the record, though, you find that it's quite different. The 50s, as you were pointing out in your opening remarks, is a very exciting, dynamic, dangerous time in international affairs. And I think he handled the international scene extremely well. But also at, on the home front, McCarthyism, um, the beginnings of the civil rights movement really taking hold in America, the, the extraordinary challenges uh, that black Americans were presenting to, to the US government and to the local state governments. This is the period of Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, and the, um, the extraordinary events in Little Rock, Arkansas, when Eisenhower had to call out the National Guard to go down you know, to help uh, black students go to public school. This is a period of extraordinary tension and controversy. And so as we have become reacquainted with Eisenhower, we've seen him in a new light, handling these kinds of challenges with great dexterity. Uh, you know, one thing I'll say, and this is maybe sort of a way to, to, to transition into our discussion of France and de Gaulle, but Eisenhower was a military man. He wasn't a politician by nature. He didn't prepare to be a politician. He didn't have a legislative agenda he wanted to accomplish. But he found himself in office, and he, you know, crises find you when you are the president. And I think he managed them extremely well. And over time, we've come to, to recognize his skill, his intelligence, his integrity. You know, American presidents have been a little, a little spotty since, uh, <laughs> since the 1968. It's been kind of uh, hit or miss. And by comparison, Eisenhower has looked better and better as time has gone on. So that's indeed a good transition to wonder the same question about Charles de Gaulle and his image and the way he's remembered today. First question I would like to ask you about that is, is he someone people even know in the United States today? Charles de Gaulle as maybe a general, about him as a French president? I mean, I think you can you could probably uh, guess where I would go with this, which is that Americans have a very short historical memory. Uh, we are... We, there are certain things we like to, 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 to revive from the past. There's a great deal that is left uh, kind of uh, alone. And so um, it depends, you know, who you're talking to. So there's a generation of Americans that still knows exactly who Charles de Gaulle was, what his role in the Second World War was especially. It's more likely that they would know him as the leader of Free France and of the resistance movement than as president. Um, that doesn't mean that they, they wouldn't recognize the, 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 the connection, but he was a kind of incandescent figure in American public life for a short period of time, and to a certain generation of Americans, and, and indeed even the children of the, of the generation that, that went through the war, they, they recall his heroism, they recall his stature, his standing, and in fact they're probably less critical of de Gaulle than French people are of de Gaulle because it's their right to be critical of their leaders. So I think, I think to the extent that de Gaulle is, is known, he's recognized as a kind of enigmatic figure, not, not a figure of great charm and warmth, but a figure of, of real heroism. And for example, I, I have a lot to do with the World War II Museum down in New Orleans, which if you haven't been, I urge everyone to go to the National World War II Museum. And every day, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from eight years old to 98 years old coming in there and reacquainting themselves with the history of the Second World War. And there they will find the story of mm. the French resistance and of de Gaulle's role. And uh, I, I think that's about where most Americans' memory will end. It's not, you know, the memory of de Gaulle as president is less vivid, I think, in their minds. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they don't recall it, but they recall that as a time of of, of tension, uncertainty. Was he on our side or was he on the other side? Did we like him or did we not like him? No one really might have those answers right at their fingertips. And that's a, what we will talk about later too, of course. Like, what, was he on our side or not? Was he in the US side? It's a good question, Or actually. a better French side? <laughs> we will talk about that, but I would like to start first um, as well about that, maybe, you know, a bit more about to France today and Charles de Gaulle, how he's been remembered in France. Do you know more about that? And if there's a similar evolution within that image of uh, Eisenhower yeah. and today. Yeah. It's fascinating, and that's a wonderful question, you know, how these uh, uh, reputations change over time. So, you know, de Gaulle in 1944, after the, as he's, he's, the, he's, he's helped to liberate France, 
Uh, he's going to become the, pre the president for his first time in office, in 44 to 46, um, as provisional president and as president. And that's a moment of great tension where he's trying to figure out, what do I do now? Am I a politician? How, what, what's my role here? And he's frustrated by politics, and he resigns, and he goes into the the years in the wilderness, and he writes memoirs and so forth, and he's a man of letters, and he kind of disappears. He doesn't come back until 1958 under very uh, murky circumstances uh, having to do with the war in Algeria. And then he has a decade-long presidency that is um, actually remarkably important and consequential, to use a word that I've used about Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. you know, he rewrites the Constitution, he creates the Fifth Republic, stabilizes France's economy, um, asserts France's presence on the world stage, is very independent from the United States from, at, from t at times, but is also allied with the West at times. So he gives France, in a sense, its voice back. Mm. I mean, the Fourth Republic, I studied the Fourth Republic, I love the Fourth Republic, <laughs> but it was a mess. Uh, de Gaulle, in a sense, gives France a sense of itself. So at that moment, he was widely, widely admired. Um, his reputation takes a turn for the worse after 1968 and, and onward because France is changing. It's becoming a younger country. The war generation is moving, um, uh, moving off the scene. Uh, he is seen as out of touch uh, with the events of 1968, not just in Paris, but around Europe and around the world. He's yesterday's man. He's a 19th century figure, like Eisenhower, born in 1890. So, there's a long period where he is sort of, no one really wants to talk much about de Gaulle. You have a socialist president in the 1980s, you know, of course he acts with a great deal of grandeur, but nonetheless he doesn't want to have anything to do with the Gaullist legacy. And the Gaullists aren't sure how much of de Gaulle they want to, to inherit. So in a way I think what's happened now is he's a figure that many political parties would like to borrow a small little dose of his reputation, his dignity, his his stature, uh, his independence on the world stage, the way in which he commanded respect from other allies, other nations, his independence, his ability to recognize communist China or travel to Romania or whatever. Um, but they wouldn't want to inherit much of the Gaullist policies. And that's, that's true on the left, and you could imagine why, but it's really even true on the far right. Many far, people on the far right still don't forgive de Gaulle for Algeria, for letting go it's of the empire. So a controversial figure still. Mm -hmm. um, I think his reputation has come back up a little bit. Uh, we see French presidents visiting uh, the various shrines of, of, of Gaullist memory. Um, but he's a complicated political figure for contemporary politics, I think. Yes, yeah, so if you continue on what you said before about the military figure becoming a politician, that's of course what you could consider binds them as a first step because of course of their roles both in the Second World War. Uh, could you explain very briefly what these both roles were and especially how that formed their career as a politician later on in life? Sure. So de Gaulle's path to, to, to renown and recognition is extraordinary. He's, he's a nobody. In 1940, the, the Germans invade France, the, the, the armistice is signed in June of 1940, and, uh, and this unknown, low-ranking general goes to London and says, uh, follow me, the battle's not over. No one, no one hears of his, his speech, um, <laughs> no one knows who he is, and he has to invent himself. He has to invent the idea of the French resistance of, of, of France Libre. And so uh, that's what he does. He, through sheer determination, with help from Winston Churchill, um, though they fought a great deal as well, he establishes a French headquarters in London and then later in Algiers to represent fighting France, the, 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 in a sense, the government in exile. Now, he is not the government. He was never elected to, to, to be the government. Actually, the legal government had been, had been left, was in Paris, was in Vichy. Uh, so he, he's, it's an ambiguous figure. Is he legitimate? Uh, uh, who, what, on what grounds does he make these claims? So, it's an extraordinary act of, of self-invention, and I think uh, he succeeds with a great deal of help from the Allies, from Churchill and then eventually Eisenhower. He will not liberate France himself as he, would, as he imagined. He's kept out of the planning for the liberation of France, for reasons we can talk about. But he is nonetheless, by 1944, the man everyone recognizes as the alternative to Vichy. Of course, there is a resistance movement inside France that begs to differ, that has a very different mm -hmm. view of things. But nonetheless, the world sees de Gaulle by 1944 as the critical man, the, the future, the alternative 
um, the, 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 the side of the resistance. Eisenhower has a much more, um, in a sense, prosaic, you know, ordinary rise. You know, he's, he's chosen by George Marshall to come to Washington and work on the staff, not because he's a great battlefield commander. In fact, he's never been in combat, but because he's a great planner. And he's known to have certain master, mastery of social skills, managing a team, and so forth. Marshall thinks the world of him and gives him the opportunity to go to London and lead the, uh, the, the buildup of American forces in Britain that will eventually um, be used to liberate first North Africa, then Italy, and then eventually France and the rest of the continent. So Eisenhower's star is rising, but it's rising a little more slowly. Uh, by 1944-45, he is recognized in America and really around the world as the man, who, the, the, the general who defeated Hitler. Obviously, there are many civilian leaders of Churchill and Roosevelt, uh, Stalin, uh, but, but it's Roosevelt, I mean, it's Eisenhower who is seen as the figure, the face of the military alliance that beat Hitler. So they have these amazing stories, and they do meet each other in 1943, and that's... Uh, that's, a, that's a, kind of an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And there's also the story, of course, of de Gaulle in quite the rage because he was kept a little bit out of the planning of <coughs> D-Day itself. Again, Roosevelt didn't really, wasn't really sure he liked de Gaulle at all. And Roosevelt really never mm -hmm. finally agreed to, to support de Gaulle's claims to, to uh, his, his standing, his stature. Eisenhower was much more, he felt more strongly that de Gaulle was really a, a great patriot, someone that, that the U.S. should get behind. So in 1943 and 1944, he, he tries to cultivate a relationship with de Gaulle. He shows him a lot of respect. He, he invites him um, to be, at least in a general sense, part of the alliance. He says, I need your help. I, I, I need your help, and I want you to help me. I, I'm coming to ask for it. You know, he does these kinds of things that show real respect toward de Gaulle. But the president and Marshall in, back in Washington, they don't want to share the details of Operation Overlord, the largest military operation of the war, with an unknown figure, um, a French leader. They don't know really who he is. So he's kept out of the plan. He also has no army. He has no military. He doesn't have anything he can bring to the table. So while Eisenhower is trying to pull him in as a friend, the Americans keep de Gaulle at arm's length. And it causes a lot of tension, as you can imagine. You're liberating France, but you don't tell the leader of the Free French when and where and how. But very quickly after D-Day, he is brought uh, into France. He is allowed to proceed to Bayeux, where he establishes his sort of provisional government. He begins a process of taking ownership of the leadership role. And Eisenhower supports that. It's important to know that Eisenhower supported it because it made military sense. It was going to help move things faster. Here was a man who had legitimacy, and he was going to help govern the country while the militaries could fight the Germans. That's exactly what Eisenhower wanted. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't some kind of sentiment sentimental move on Eisenhower's part. It was a burden sharing. You are going to be the, run the, the government, and you can get the water running, and you can help work with civilian authorities to deal with your French problems. I've got to go f beat the Germans. That's a pretty good, pretty good uh, division of labor. That's not how Roosevelt saw it, but that's how Eisenhower saw it, and he had the command of the militaries in the field, so he got his way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're mentioning that Eisenhower was more thinking about an alliance or to cooperate that will, of course, continue well into the future indeed, together. Indeed. Um, and so it would be interesting to talk about the period after the Second World War, of course, in which both are rising within politics and, of course, have to deal with the Reconstruction period and then especially, of course, the Cold War that is right. all evolving at the time of their presidencies. And, of course, uh, Eisenhower is president before, but when de Gaulle uh, steps in, he's also part yes. of that, of course. Both have, uh, well, quite differing reactions, or at least on how to rebuild Europe, what the position of France should be within Europe how uh, they should cooperate with the U.S.? Yes, I mean, uh, they had an enormous number of, of uh, major issues that they, that they had to work through. The first thing to remember is to put this in, in chronology. So, you know, one of Eisenhower's major roles after World War II is that he is asked by President Truman to come back into, you know, he retired, and he was asked to come back into uniform and lead the new NATO alliance. Eisenhower is the first commander of NATO. That's very important. He believes strongly in NATO, that NATO is the answer. Mm 
an alliance of democracies, of Western democracies, they're not all democracies in 1949, that's okay. Um, an alliance of Western states that basically yeah. share common <laughs> aims, common interests. That's what he believes in. And he feels that this is a perfect solution to Europe's problems. Uh, and, you know, uh, initially, Germany is not a member of the NATO alliance. Eisenhower, in the long run, feels it should be. He believes in bringing all of the Western uh, European countries together in a common alliance, as well as closer European integration. De Gaulle takes a very different view, and he comes into power, you know, back into office in 1958 when NATO is already established, and he immediately begins to challenge this architecture. Why? Uh, what is it about NATO and about the European, the, a tighter European Union that bothers him? I think, you know, to, Eisenhower and many people who followed Eisenhower, was, he was an Atlanticist. He believed that the, in the Atlantic nations that shared a common identity, common values. De Gaulle was a man of the great nation states, a 19th century person like we talked about before. But also he believed in the importance of sovereignty. And he believed particularly in the importance of French sovereignty. Now NATO was headquartered in Paris. Uh, and yet uh, France was only one nation of, of, of a dozen, and eventually even more. Um, it didn't have the standing within NATO that de Gaulle felt it should have. And as you know, one of the first things that de Gaulle tries to do is to kind of rewrite the rules of NATO. And, and, and he approaches the US and Britain and says, what if we had a, a group of three that really ran things? <laughs> and this is, uh, this is when Eisenhower is president. And uh, Eisenhower disagrees vehemently with that because it would weaken NATO. And again, his whole, much of his, his his post-war life is about building and securing NATO. So he fights with de Gaulle a lot about this idea. And he says, we, we, we're there for you. We have a nuclear deterrent. Um, we've, got the, we've, we've, we've funded the Marshall Plan. We've helped French reconstruction. What more evidence could you have that we, we have your back? Um, all we're asking is that you take one seat at the table and allow some of these other smaller countries to have a seat as well. And that's not good enough for de Gaulle. And I, I, think, I think it's part of his um, sense that France is a different nation altogether from the smaller countries of Europe, but indeed from Germany, which he still is very wary about German power, one day maybe overwhelming France, not militarily, but economically. And so he's, he struggles, he fights against the restrictions of both the European Union or European economic community and of NATO. And they, they, they resolve this the American way, which is, well, we have the power and we're going to do it this way. And so we're not going to change NATO for you. And as eventually, after uh, Eisenhower is out of office, uh, de Gaulle mm -hmm. will make NATO pay. And he says, all right, then you have to go to Brussels. <laughs> you, <laughs> you have to live somewhere else. You can't be here. And he withdraws um, France from a portion of the NATO alliance, not completely out of the NATO alliance. But it's a it's a way of saying we're independent. We have our own nuclear weapon. We won't be told what to do. Honestly, if the tables were turned and the United States was a medium-sized country in Europe, but everything else was the same, mm -hmm. we would never join an alliance like NATO. So, I mean, it's, if you turn the te telescope around, it's perfectly logical. A patriotic, um, proud, uh, individualistic people who believe themselves to be exceptional, that's America and that's France. So it's really not so hard to understand what de Gaulle was trying to accomplish. Um, it might not have been necessary, but I think I can understand where he was coming from. Interesting to see the, yeah, <laughs> that turnaround the yeah. table that makes it indeed a different vision because you might think, how can you be so ungrateful maybe as France to not you know, include the United States more av after the liberation, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there was a lot of criticism <laughs> yes, of the exactly. French withdrawal from NATO about the question, are you ungrateful? You know, look what we did mm. for you. 1917 we came, 1944 uh, we came. But honestly, that's not what uh, was at stake. Mm. It, 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 it was about a, 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 a balance of power system that de Gaulle was much more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he viewed the Soviet Union, of course he didn't like communism, he was anti-communist, but he viewed the Soviet Union in much the way he might have viewed the Russian Empire, as just another big power on the map. Mm -mm. So let's have a balance of power. Let's negotiate. Let's, let's have diplomatic relations with everybody. It's really back to the 19th century concert of Europe model. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, he was much more comfortable in the 19th century. In some ways, you might think he was born in 1790 instead of 1890. <laughs> and I think in that sense, his conceptions were 
uh, out of step with the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And would you also explain, because in 1960 he does the first nuclear tests in, in France to show we can do this too. Yes, although yeah. uh, let me give a shout out to the Fourth Republic because yeah. of course the, uh, the nuclear program has begun uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Fourth Republic. And indeed, it's another instance of Ameri Franco-American yeah. conflict <laughs> over the Suez Crisis that might have something to do with this. The Suez Crisis was that famous incident in 1956 when France and Britain and Israel secretly colluded to invade Egypt. They lied about it. Uh, they said, well, oh, but, uh, the UN something something, um, Nasser something something. What they really wanted to do is they wanted to overthrow Nasser because he had nationalized the Suez Canal. But they lied about it to Eisenhower, and Eisenhower made them pay. He mm -hmm. used all of the levers that America has, which are quite substantial, to compel the British to withdraw. And once the British withdrew, the French said, well, now we can't stay on this alone, and they began to withdraw from this invasion of Egypt. And this is hugely important because the, the, the French uh, Fourth Republic leaders drew the conclusion that, you, A, you can never rely on the British, which is a very French conclusion. Mm. <laughs> but B, uh, we have to make closer friends with the Germans and we need an atomic program. And this begins to put into motion not only the development of France's nuclear energy industry, but also the beginnings uh, of the planning for uh, a nuclear weapon. And de Gaulle, of course, embraces this as um, not only a sign of France's scientific prowess and its moderniz modernization, but uh, the great powers on the Security Council, um, you know, Britain and the United States have nuclear weapons. Uh, Soviets certainly do. Uh, the Chinese probably will one day, and indeed they're about to get one at this time. He doesn't want to be <laughs> the only yeah. country yeah. without uh, <laughs> nuclear weapons, and so he um, is glad to see this move forward. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's not something the Americans are happy about. At the same time, it's consistent in a way with French policy, mm -hmm. French a, a desire for independence. And they're concerned, Americans are concerned about proliferation, and that's something that they have to argue about. But in Eisenhower's case, he felt nuclear sharing with allies was a good thing. Uh, but he was actually constrained by American law to do a great deal of nuclear sharing. So it's a fascinating moment, mm -hmm. you know. How do nuclear weapons weigh in this alliance? And quite also interesting in the current affairs, probably to think about. But um, yes, well, let's let's yeah, not, let's hope another, we don't have to deal with yeah. the nuclear question <laughs> exactly. today. But you're quite right; it's mm -mm. it's an issue. Mm -hmm. And so, going back to the Cold War, and of course, there's these moments of the NATO tensions, the the nuclear stories, but also, of course. It's a moment where de Gaulle is visiting Eisenhower in 1960, the state visit. In the exhibition, there are some photos of that moment, yes. some of these portraits in, in the residence at different places. Um, and he, so de Gaulle describes this moment, uh, saying, all the way from the airport to Blair House, I drove alongside President Eisenhower to a deafening ac accompaniment of cheers, sirens, and brass bands amidst a forest of banners and flags. And so apparently the estimates were that there were 200,000 people standing to cheer de Gaulle and Eisenhower as, of course, the heroes of the Second World War, but also as the president. Yes. So could you comment on that state visit, the moment, and also the hopes that they had for that moment of that state visit? Yes. Well, first of all, that's a wonderful image that you describe of you know, hundreds of thousands of people waving and shouting and applauding, here comes de Gaulle. And of course, this is in 1960. It's only 15 years since the end of the Second World War. So everybody over the age of 15 you know, was alive when, when de Gaulle was, uh, was leading Free France. And many adults who were, who were there cheering remembered the World War II alliance. So this is very much about that moment. It's about embracing the, our old ally uh, and welcoming him. I will say that state visits were a much bigger deal mm -hmm. uh, in the early Cold War than they are today. Now, the context of that visit is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. One of the figures who came on a state visit right before de Gaulle was Nikita Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. Khrushchev had come to the United States because Eisenhower had invited him to come and he was trying to work out a better relationship. They were arguing, particularly arguing over the control of the city of Berlin. And he thought, if I can get Khrushchev in, maybe we can swap stories and we can end the Cold War. Uh, you know, it didn't work out quite that way. Khrushchev's visit is a big success, but it's also a very um, humorous chapter in many ways in, in uh, U.S.-Soviet relations. But the point <laughs> is that uh, Eisenhower feels that he must consult with his allies before he does anything. He doesn't want to strike an agreement with Khrushchev over Berlin or Germany or any issue without consulting Britain and France. And he does that. He goes to Britain, he goes to Paris, and then he, of course, welcomes de Gaulle for this important state visit. Mm 
which is a, a, a prequel, a curtain raiser to the big event that's going to happen in mm -hmm. May, in Paris in May of 1960. Everyone is looking forward to that event. So the state visit is an important um, reaffirmation of the Franco-American alliance between, uh, uh, and, and a particularly the friendship between de Gaulle and Eisenhower. I, I'll just you know, say that um, these, these kinds of gestures matter a great deal in diplomacy, but also in life. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're invited to a friend's house and they really put out a nice dinner for you, you're like, these people really like me. I mean, this yeah, is really, honored. I'm very, I feel, I feel very <laughs> honored. I mean, it, it matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you can get 200,000 people shrieking and waving when you come in from the airport, it's a <laughs> sign of some warmth, of some respect. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Eisenhower had a, had a, his, 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 he, he bought a house in, in uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in the middle of the 1950s, a very modest little farm. He, he often spent many weekends there, and he invited de Gaulle to come mm. with him uh, to, to visit his farm in Gettysburg. And, you know, I don't know if you've been to the Gettysburg, Eisenhower House at Gettysburg. It's very modest. It's mm -hmm. a very small, little suburban place, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's set up just as Eisenhower and Mamie Eisenhower had mm. left it. You can still see the, the sort of remote control of the TV is on the, is on the coffee table, and the walls are all in mm -hmm. pink and green because that was Mamie's favorite color. He invites de Gaulle into his world, and he mm -hmm. says, this is me. Mm -hmm. He shows him his barnyard. He shows him you know, his house. And of course, they go and look at the Gettys Gettysburg battlefield together, and that's a moment of great solidarity between mm -hmm. two old soldiers. So you know, these things, um, I think, especially to a man like de Gaulle, for whom um, symbols mattered so much, it's a huge sign of respect. Mm -hmm. And so what happened just after that? Because there's this hope of the talks of the big four and yes. this moment. Does it work out the way they were hoping there in Gettysburg? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a catastrophe. What mm. happens in, in, in May, the, just a month later, um, is one of Eisenhower's great failures, fr quite frankly. And I think also a great what might have been mm -hmm. in history. Uh, it's a complicated story, but suffice it to say that on the eve of the summit with the Soviets, Eisenhower allows the CIA to um, use its U-2 aircraft to fly over Soviet airspace illegally, taking photographs of their missile installations. And the Soviets have been trying and trying and trying to shoot down these planes. They know that they're there, but they can't, their, their missiles don't reach that high. Finally, they get one. It comes crashing down. They capture the pilot alive. They capture the plane. They confront Eisenhower about it. He lies about it. He refuses to apologize. And then the, the, he goes to Paris. The, the whole thing has completely is in tatters. De Gaulle is very supportive, and he says, of course you're not going to get down on bended knee and, and apologize. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a great nation. Of course you're not going to do that. He understands Eisenhower has made a blunder, mm -hmm. but he's also very supportive, and he says it's going to blow up. Uh, that's life. You know, so it's a moment of terrible, ter bitter uh, uh, di uh, disappointment for Eisenhower, not to mention the world, mm -hmm. because he was very reluctant to use those U-2 aircraft. His CIA director, Alan Dulles, had kept saying, oh, come on, just a couple more flights. It'll be fine. You know, they, they, they can't get these things. Mm. Eisenhower's saying, it'd be a big deal if they shot one down. Uh, Dulles says, it'll never happen. Mm. And on the eve of his, maybe his great legacy conference where Khrushchev is going to be there and de Gaulle will be there and, and, and the British will be there, the whole thing is blown apart. So, um, you know, presidents make mistakes. This was one of them for Eisenhower, but... Uh, it, it is also a moment when, what, what can de Gaulle do? He's the host of the conference. He understands the whole thing mm -hmm. has blown up. And he says, I, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, I'm here uh, to support my, my allies. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's not much that he can do, but it's, it's nice at least that he doesn't rub the American's face in it. Exactly. There's support. There's that yeah. alliance, the importance of that friendship yeah. that they had celebrated or marked. Um, and so, of course, both of them, so we have discussed Cold War, and there's so much, of course, that we could discuss, but there's also decolonization happening at yeah. this time, particularly, of course, in France, the whole period of decolonization after the Second World War. And then there's, a, so there's, of course, um, Algeria, Indochina, related, obviously, to Vietnam here for the United States. Yeah, there's yeah. an often just think think of all, think see how important the 50s are. I mean, this yeah. is what uh, makes me keep coming back to them. <laughs> it's a it's a hugely complex time for France. Of course, is yeah. is confronting the legacy of its empire and it's it's uh, the rise of anti-colonial nationalism, which is powerful and global. Mm -hmm. And France fights a very very costly, difficult, and finally uh, you know a failing effort to maintain its uh, Indochina. 
um, imperial holdings. Uh, it tries all kinds of political ideas. Oh, well, we all have a different kind of arrangement, but the Vietnamese don't want to be ruled by France under any circumstances. So a decade-long mm -hmm. colonial conflict, which comes to an end with the partition of Vietnam uh, and the French withdrawal. During that time, Eisenhower was president for two, at least two years of that period, um, from, from 52 to, to, to 54. And he strongly opposed getting involved. Now, this is a question where you talked about, yeah. what, have I done for, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. You know, so the French come and they ask, can you send planes? Can you send soldiers? Can you send weapons? Can you help us bomb uh, the Vietnamese uh, who are, who are uh, fighting against us? And Eisenhower says, nope, uh, this is a bad setup, and uh, America should not get into a ground war in Asia under any circumstances. We're giving you money. Americans were funding a lot of the Vietnam War. But Eisenhower also had a, a larger strategic I, you know, vision, which was, we're trying, we're trying to be different from the Europeans. We don't want to be tarnished with the same brush of empire and imperialism. We have a different view of how world relations should be organized, so we don't want to bail out your failing empire. And it was a tough, uh, tough time in Franco-American relations because the Americans didn't, at least not in 1954. Yeah. But then very quickly you get the Suez Crisis, and that's another example of Eisenhower saying, we don't want to be part of your uh, colonial conflicts you know, elsewhere. And in 1958, uh, you know, the Algerian War is underway, and Eisenhower again is sort of saying, this is not a winning war for you. It's not a way to assure your future. Eisenhower offers to mediate in that conflict, and that's really one of the moments when the army, the French army in Algeria says, uh-oh, uh, maybe, maybe we're going to have to take, take over the government completely. And mm -hmm. there's the threats of a coup d'etat in France. Uh, and that's when the Fourth Republic invites Charles de Gaulle to come back to power. Mm -hmm. And uh, his role as president then is, I have to deal with these, these upstart generals in Algiers. I have to figure out what to do with Algeria. And I have to rewrite the Constitution. I mean, 1958 is a busy year for, for de Gaulle. <laughs> so in any case, they have, this is the, I'll just end by saying, de Gaulle's views change. And this is the sign of a great leader. Mm -hmm. He evolves. Yes, he's a man of the 19th century. Yes, he's stuck in his ways in many respects. Yes, he's an autocrat. But on the colonial question, he, he saw which way the wind was blowing. Mm -hmm. And he does what a good military leader would do, which is to cut your losses. He says, we're not going to win this thing, and it's time for us to get out. Let's get out um, under circumstances that we can control. So we'll have a new legal relationship. We'll have access to some of the oil wells in the Sahara. Um, but we can't keep fighting forever. And this is very unpopular with a small segment of the military and, and of the right. Uh, they feel he's betrayed them. But of course, it's a relief to many uh, people in France who are tired of colonial wars, tired of being saddled with this reputation of being a colonial power. Now, this is a good story in a sense of France and America eventually aligning. But let's be honest, America behaves like an imperial power all the time. Mm -hmm. We just don't call it an empire. Mm -hmm. Now, I can say that about the United States because I'm an American. And, but <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, criticize France, but I will say that the United States always thinks of itself as an anti-imperial mm -hmm. nation, but in many respects uses its military power all around the world to advance its own interests. So sometimes Europeans feel Americans are a little hypocritical when they criticize empire, but then sometimes behave a little bit like the old empires. Mm -hmm. But in this case, Eisenhower and de Gaulle finally came together on the fact that empire was an old form of government. Mm -hmm. And uh, th something new was emerging, and that was where they should focus. Yeah. And so what about, because of course, uh, after Eisenhower, the situation changes quite a lot with the Vietnam War. And so, of course, de Gaulle is pronouncing himself quite directly against that. So that's what you're saying, the adaptation and maybe recognition. Yes, it's a remarkable mm -hmm. turnaround, isn't yes. it? Suddenly, <laughs> America is fighting in Vietnam. Uh, huge escalation in 1965. Um, and it will continue right through 1970, and then the Americans won't fully get out until the mid-70s. And de Gaulle is now in the position of saying, this is, this is a losing conflict. We tried this. They, they don't want. <laughs> you know, and the Americans say, well, we're not emp an empire. We're, mm -hmm. we, we believe in a free South, South Vietnam, a free and democratic South Vietnam. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, South Vietnam was not free. It was governed by a dictator. Um, and it was supplied heavily with American arms and, and intelligence. Uh, and then it became a military dictatorship. So 
America made all the same mistakes that not only France had done, but that Britain had done, that other empires had done in the past, and it paid the price. Mm -hmm. De Gaulle saw it coming, and he was right. So it's painful to be criticized by your friends and your NATO allies, but in retrospect, he was right. Mm -hmm. And so we have discussed quite a lot of different aspects, of course, and um, kind of to conclude, what can we say about this relationship? Because we have seen some quite some similarities, some evolutions between these friendships, the relationships. Um, how would you evaluate their relationship from, from today's standpoint, looking back to that relationship? I think that, um, you know, the, the Second World War is almost a century in the past yeah. 80 years. Uh, those who fought in it are almost entirely gone. Uh, even some of the children who lived through it um, are, are past. So our memories of that period are no longer our own memories. We're learning from, from books, we're learning from, from films and from museums and from exhibitions like this. And I think one of the things that we can learn is, uh, you know, historic figures find a way to cross, you know, linguistic, cultural divides. Mm -hmm. And Eisenhower and de Gaulle couldn't be more different in their characters, where they began, their early life, their family life. I mean, Eisenhower was absolutely broke, poor, living in Kansas. How could he imagine ever becoming a general, much less president? <laughs> de Gaulle, quite different, a much more elite figure. Um, but they found a common language. And I'll just not, I don't want to sound too bombastic, but I think this is what they would say. They mm -hmm. would say the common language was freedom. That's what we believed in. And in 1940, there was no reason to think France would ever be a sovereign again. So let's not forget the sacrifices that they made, not just the, uh, in, in, in waging the conflict, but, but de Gaulle turned his back on his entire world. He went off into the unknown in 1940. He had no chance of success. He turned on his mentor, uh, Pétain. It was a time of real risk and daring and, and, and so forth. And so why did they make such extraordinary choices? Why did they work so hard? Why did they fight so hard? And I think, honestly, they felt if they didn't do it, you know, democracy and free government was going to be extinguished for their lifetimes. That's not a small thing. And we take it for granted. We shouldn't. Uh, today, more than ever, perhaps, we're reminded, oh, it turns out that uh, freedom is fragile. There are nefarious actors in the world who don't like democracy. Mm -hmm. Democracy is embattled around the world today. It's eroding everywhere, including in the United States. So these are systems that have to be protected, cultivated, defended. I think Eisenhower and de Gaulle would, that's what they would say, don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And that could also be considered the legacy for today French-American relations that are still, of course, fighting for that same ideal and working together on multiple fronts. I mean, honestly, I, I think it's extraordinary if you, if, you, if you step back a little bit. Of course, there are tactical disagreements, mm -hmm. as there always are. But step back a moment and look at what the Allies in 1949 wrought, which when they created NATO. For a long time, NATO sat around doing nothing. And lots of people said, why do we need NATO? What does it ever do? What is, what's, mm -hmm. it, what's its importance? You know, it went through the whole Cold War without really having to, to do anything. Suddenly, NATO is in more demand than ever. It's got more members than ever. It has long-time neutral nations want to join. What does this tell us? It tells us that people are anxious about the prospects of, of democracy in the world, that there are tyrants with, with nuclear weapons who want to do bad things. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is an amazing achievement that was, that, was, uh, that was brought out of the disaster of the war. And you know, when I teach students who are American students, 18, 19, 20 years old, they don't really know much of this material. Why would they? But they can, I think, um, be um, brought to this sense of uh, you know, the high stakes that not only p people in the past experienced, I mean, in your period of the revolution, I mm -hmm. mean, the French Revolution and the American Revolution, talk about high stakes, talk about people taking risks. Yeah. Um, there are these great moments in history when you know, all of the threads suddenly concentrate in one place and there is this sense of contingency. What if, what if it didn't work out that way? We would all be in a very different place. You know, Eisenhower, de Gaulle, these kinds of people were there at the time. So we need to pay attention to what lessons mm -hmm. they can tell us. And could you end maybe with 
because you've studied Eisenhower extensively, of course, would you have one lesson maybe in his leadership or in his uh, political skills, military skills, um, that you would consider a good lesson for today's world and a particular lesson? I would say um, some combination of empathy and respect. Uh, Eisenhower was a winner. He, he, he could have been a huge egotist. You know, everything he touched turned to gold. He, he just, he never, he never met defeat. But he was a remarkably modest man. And as a leader, both in the war and then as president, mm -hmm. he, he took great care to listen to his allies. He let the British yell at him all the time during the Second World War. He helped de Gaulle when de Gaulle needed help. He was a man who said, I, I can see the world from your perspective. You need my help. I, ha I can help you. Why wouldn't I? So that sense of empathy and mutual respect is something, again, is not, does not come automatically, especially in international relations when there's so much rivalry and there's so much tension. Um, he just had a way of putting people at their ease and making, him, making them feel that he had their best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a gift. It, it's just a gift of his personality. Um, I, I think, uh, to some extent, Franklin Roosevelt had that gift as well. We've had leaders who have, who have had that, those characteristics. But we're lucky when we get them because it's rare. And so I would just say cultivate empathy, cultivate, mm -hmm. listen to, your, to people you disagree with, find the common values and work on that uh, mm -hmm. as you work through your own alliances in life. Wow. Beautiful lesson <laughs> to end this. Thank you so much. Thank you.